The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. At that time, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Together were Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll come with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When it was already dawn, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, No. So he said to them, Cast a net over the right side of the boat, and you will find something. So they cast it, and were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard it was the Lord, he tucked in his garment, for he was lightly clad, and jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, but they went out far from shore, only about a hundred yards, dragging the net with the fish. When they climbed out on shore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore, full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because he realized it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them, and in like manner the fish. This was now the third time Jesus was revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, they said, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Simon Peter answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to Simon Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that Jesus had said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. The Gospel of the Lord. Sydney and Tilly were very happily married for many years, but Sydney got sick and uh, he was getting sicker and sicker, so he uh, called Tilly over one day and said, Tilly, uh, I'm going to die, uh, but I want you to take these three envelopes I'm uh, giving to you, and these express my last wishes. And so when I die, take each of the envelopes in proper order and do what it tells you to do. Now, Sidney was a very thoughtful man. He was one of those sort of control freaks that had everything all lined up, even his funeral. And so when it was all over with, uh, her friend said to her, well, what was in the envelopes? She said, well, the first one was a check for $5,000. And it said, buy me a nice casket. So I got him a nice mahogany casket, nice and comfortable inside and I'm sure he'll be very comfortable there forever. He said, then the second one was uh, one for the funeral. He said, give me a nice funeral. So we had a nice funeral ceremony at the church, and then we had a lovely uh, banquet, a luncheon afterwards. And I had all his finest foods, the things that he liked, and I knew that his friends were like. 
And so they said, okay, well, what was the third one? She says, well, the third one uh, was a check for $50,000. He said, buy a nice stone. 10 carat, what do you think of it? So you have to be careful. Um, but I'm not thinking so much about the humor about the stone as I want to talk a little bit about three. You ever notice in the scripture and in life itself, uh, things uh, usually come in threes. Now, there's a human metaphor somehow that three works. In jokes, there's always three things. You know, the Irishman, the Italian, and the Pole. Uh, the Franciscan, the Dominican, and the Benedictine. Uh, there's always three, not two, not four. Two's not enough to make it work. Four begins to make it complicated. Uh, so two is enough. It's sufficient to make the whole ploy work. It's kind of cryptic, a symbolic sign that has everything to do with making the right point. Passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus has a right point to make and therefore uses three all the time. Jesus returns to the prayer in this Garden of Gethsemane three times. How many disciples did he take with him? Three. Peter denies him three times. On the way of the cross, Jesus falls three times. On Calvary, three are crucified. Jesus hangs on the cross for how many hours? Three hours. And so these stories of Sidney and Tilly, are just sufficient to get our attention and to emphasize the depth of what's going on in the life of Jesus. After his death, Jesus appears three times as a gardener, a housebreaker, and a chef. These coincide, as we'll explain, with the times of grief, discouragement, and hunger. He appears to Mary Magdalene, who's so full of grief that through her tears she thinks Jesus is the gardener. He housebreaks only through locked doors and comes, we read last week, stands in the midst of the disciples and says, peace be with you. The disciples were hanging out there wondering where they would go from here and Jesus had plans for them. Finally, in today's gospel, he appears on the shoreline as a chef. Picture Jesus with his white coat on and his chef's hat and his, his grill, uh, making f grilled fish. Was well, pretty plentiful, well, it depends who was doing the fishing. So the disciples were still in this situation. Remember, this is Easter Sunday. Everything in John happens on Easter Sunday. Jesus goes back to heaven on Easter Sunday. So you've got to cram a lot in there. That's why Matthew, Mark, and Luke sort of spread out the story. And so he's making this fish because he knows they're hungry and they're despondent. And he knows they're really going to want to see him. So they don't know what to do, and so they think maybe they'll go back to their former way of life. But their little hearts weren't really in it. They wanted to fish, but yet they really didn't want either. They were hungry for something more, and Jesus wanted to whet their appetite by spending some time with them. This is the third time Jesus has revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. The three appearances are just enough to make the point. Jesus has been raised up, and there is enough to counter those points. The grief, discouragement, and spiritual hunger. Grief. Well, we think of many of the things that are happening in the world today. It seems like you think it's over and then some other crazy things happen. Someone uh, takes out a gun and starts shooting people. It doesn't seem to be a very good thing at all. So we think of all the people that have been killed. Going back how many years, all the shootings in schools, in mosques and synagogues and churches. People just come in and start killing people. We see how maddening the world is. When we think of some of these mind-blowing tragedies and those who work so relentlessly to work at removing any mention of God from religion uh, from the public form, all uh, fall silent and threaten no lawsuits as everybody, from the president down to the president of the student council, call for prayers openly and unceasingly, implicitly acknowledging that God is to be prayed to him. Where else do we turn at times like that that are so confusing? Confusing. What else do we can we do except to look to a power higher than ourselves? We do that because some things are too terrible for the human mind to comprehend or to understand or 
uh, to challenge the prejudice that's there. So sometimes stunned before this mess of evil beyond our comprehension before or rational explanation, we instinctively fall to our knees. We're like Mary Magdalene at the tomb, full of questions and full of tears. We have to trust that the one who told Mary not to weep over her loss is not unmindful of our loss, our tears and our shock. It is in grief time that Jesus makes his appearance in various ways. So the disciples were, we said in the upper room, completely empty, numb and discouraged. They left everything to follow him and now he seems to have left them in death. Where was he when they needed him the most? No wonder Thomas was dubious that he really raised the dead. As we saw, they were going back to the trade they knew. They weren't all fishermen, but enough of them were that the rest of us went along and did whatever they were doing. The question remains to us many times. Back then, could God not have done something to prevent these shootings, this loss of life? We always ask these questions, but we know that there are no real answers. Where was God when we need him? How do we, a grieving people, go on in our personal grief at times or some of these larger senses of grief? Like the disciples were behind the impenetrable, impenetrable doors of doubt and fear, asking what is happening to us as a people, happening to us as a nation. But Jesus had penetrated the door and uttered his word, Shalom, peace. Breathes into us his spirit and lets us know that pain and death ever since his resurrection are not the last words that we have now abiding with us the steadfast spirit of God who will not go away, who is incapable of leaving us. In the dark hallow of the upper room, Jesus, the wounded, risen Christ, has spoken peace and so he does now. We hunger. Remember the story of the road to Emmaus. Two hungry, discouraged disciples are moving away from Jerusalem into the sunset. And Jesus comes and starts to walk along with them, but they somehow don't recognize him until they come to an inn and they sit down with Jesus and he takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to them and then disappears. And they say, my heavens, that was the Lord. So on the shoreline, not one of the dispirited Disciples who recognized Jesus did not say. He didn't say it's Jesus, but he said it's the Lord, which really is a much more important and more powerful name than Jesus. The Kyrios means this is the one who's in charge of the whole universe. Jesus means Savior, but Kyrios means something much greater even than that. It's the one who's over everything. And remember, we share that. You know, St. Paul says we're in the same will as Jesus is for the same thing that Jesus is in for, everything. Yes, Lord, the transformed Jesus knew beyond what they, Jesus knew what they didn't know. And now the jumps in the water to get to him while all the while Jesus is calmly setting up a cookout for them since he knows they're hungry. And so we're hungry for answers. Like us, they were hungry for meaning. Life is not and cannot be about endless consumption, conceit, and competition. We don't live on bread alone. We're hungry for relationships that don't exploit, friendships that don't betray, and a God who makes all things new again, even out of senseless tragedy. Jesus' cookout, of course, is not an answer in itself, but a reassurance, again, of Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. He who eats this bread will live forever and never die which is to say that his life, teaching, and resurrection are nourishment, even when especially in times of tragedy. How can we our, lead our world, our nation, back to God into sanity? In our nation as a whole today, we've asked God to get out of our face, to go away, to mind his own business, to let us do what we want to do, not to tell us things are right or wrong, but it's all about what I want. And then we're surprised that terrible things happen when we say, God, remove your protective hand from our society. There's evil in the world to be seen, more evil than we ever see. It's all um, sometimes called the deep state, and it's really there. Powerful, evil people behind the scenes that control things that we don't know anything about. While people in so-called power pretend 
to do what they want to do and they're really not calling shots anyway. But we have the power to deal with it because God has given us power. We are God's family, we're his people together as a people not only in sheer might, but also in spiritual power. Godly people can do it, but if not, it will consume us. We have to come more fully to Christ and rebuild the fallen walls of the church. Let's think long and hard how we have become a part of the problem rather than the solution. Is it just church talk or how's the country fallen hard since God has been given the door? Since abortion has become a right? Since the sin of every person is good because they want their rights, even if these rights are not good for the common good or for society? The Catholics have become wimps. We allow the pagans out there in the world to call the shots, to change our society, to change the whole Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, to give it to the devil. We allow the pagans to do whatever they want to do, and so we're afraid to stand up for the truth. We'd rather just sit back and go along and look what's happening. Please pray for God to strengthen your back and my backbone and help us to stand up for the truth. This is the gospel made for today, the light highlighting these three fundamental human conditions and emotions, grief, discouragement, and hunger. It's also a gospel of three approaches, to not weep, shalom, and eat. Three words, the right three words for troubled times, maybe even now, especially in these times of tragedy. Let's ask the Lord to help us to think this out, to think how does it change? How do we keep it from going deeper and deeper and deeper in the pit? Where will it be 30 years from now? if we don't take some action. Look to where it is now today because we haven't taken any action in the last 50 years. There's not much left to religion, much left to sanity, much to integrity, much to morality. We either have a choice to let it go the way it's going or stand up and power and harness the power Jesus has given to us to make things different and to make things new.